Hi, this is Jurgen Rasmussen. Welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Vlog. This is a part two of the video I made titled Psychopathy, Spiritual Awakening, and Psychotherapy. I want to make some quick clarifications around that. So, in that video, I talked about what's called uh, Keegan's Stage 2. This is based upon Robert Keegan's uh, model of adult development, which seems to correspond pretty well with what they in uh, Jane Lovinger and, and uh, the, the model has been expanded by Susan Cook Reuters, ego development model, what you would call the opportunist, and also what Claire Graves would call CP and Don Beck and Claire Graves in their spiral dynamic system would call the red V-meme. So uh, from a developmental perspective, I, I made the claim that people who are strongly psychopathic uh, seem to be stuck at this developmental stage. I described the stage pretty well in the previous videos. If you haven't watched it, I, I urge you to go back and, and, and watch it. I, I, I think the clarification I need to make is that I'm not at all suggesting that most adults who operate at that particular developmental stage are psychopathic. What, what I am suggesting is that I strongly suspect that, that people who are highly psychopathic have not evolved beyond that particular developmental stage. Because capacities such as guilt, having a conscience, uh, being able to be motivated by psycholog psychological abstractions, intimacy, uh, mutuality, uh, the, the, the ability to experience these things are a, a developmental achievement where you have to be able to hold two perspectives simultaneously. You have to internalize the views of significant others and have they co-construct and shape how you experience yourself or internalize some particular uh, ideology or religion or political philosophy and 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 have your perception of how well you live up to those standards shape your very sense of self a kind of interpersonal self now of course some adults move beyond that to a self-authoring uh, mind where they're able to take a step back from the ideologies they have internalized and have their own seat of authority in terms of evaluating that. And some people also evolve beyond that as well. Um, but, but the important point to make is that most of the people who are adults, likely, who operate from uh, Keegan Stage 2, uh, the, the red system in spiral dynamics, or or the opportunist in, in ego development are likely not psychopathic. It also depends on your particular constellation of personality tendencies. So as we talked about in the previous video, people who are psychopathic, that the hallmarks of it, in addition to lacking a conscience and any sense of remorse, is a kind of fearless temperament and disposition, uh, a kind of dis embiddedness, you know, uh, impulsivity, um, and, and people being callous, lacking pro-social emotions. So on, on a five-factor personality test, you know, these people would score high on certain aspects of extroversion, low on conscientiousness. This is where the impulsivity, the failure to think ahead, the failure to take responsibility, these sorts of things and also low on agreeableness with their callousness and their antagonism. So if, if someone's personality tendencies are such that they are higher in agreeableness or higher in conscientiousness, for example, 
pe people can be uh, at that particular developmental stage and, and not at all be psychopathic. Remember that someone might be fused with their own perceived uh, enduring needs and enduring interests and agendas, but they, they might have a perceived need to be a nice or a good person. There's a well-known story of a young man who walks across the street to guide an old woman and her luggage across the street to help her, and he does so. And when they get to the other side of the street, the old woman says, you know, young man, I was, I was waiting for someone to pick me up over there. So, so, so clearly, this guy had a, a need to be a good person and to help, but it, it was all about his need to be useful and helpful. He, he was not able to, to have a shared understanding uh, or, or appreciate uh, the, the other person's perspective while satisfying his own need to be, to, to, to be helpful. So that that that's the first thing I want to I want to emphasize. Now, according to to uh, Chris Coven, who I trained with in Spiral Dynamics, he he would disagree with me. He he would say that no, you you can find psychopathy all over the spiral, meaning at at more uh, developmental uh, or, or higher stages of of development. Uh, Susan Cook Reuter in personal communication has said that no, you you can you can probably find both strong narcissistic tendencies and psychopathic tendencies in in people who have moved beyond uh, that particular early stage. So who knows? This is just m my opinion and 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 my observations. Although. If, if someone doesn't have the capacity to become socialized, so to speak, uh, to develop any sense of empathy or any sense of, of uh, having their own experience of their very self be mutually co-constructed, um, you, you, you got to consider whether that person ever could develop out of that pre-socialized um, developmental stage where they can begin to develop a, a psychological identity or, or an, an, an adult sense of self, which is what people who have these sorts of, of, of personality disorder tendencies tend not to have. So uh, consider that. The, the second thing, what, when I talked about uh, coaching or, or, or psychotherapy, um, I, I forgot to mention a couple of things. So in, in addition to the kind of cognitive behavioral type therapy of, of prolonging the, the space between stimuli and response and, 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 and doing your best to frame developing those skills as a way of having more agency and more power, um, there, there, there is something to be said about the psychopathic individual who is mainly concerned with power and dominance. If, 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 someone, if someone's orientation is primarily about power and dominance in life, that kind of shows a, a misunderstanding as to the nature of their own experience. Um, one uh, guy who specialized in psychopathy called Steve Becker, um, he wrote something in his book called The Inner World of the Psychopath, which is an excellent book. He, he wrote that everyone is looking out to satisfy their basic needs, but the, the, for the psychopath, it stops there. there there's, there's nothing beyond that, uh, in a sense. So there's a, there's a lack, you know, there, there, there's a shallowness of emotion. There's, there's a lack of any psychological depth. There, there's a lack of, of an inner subjectivity and appreciation of other people's inner subjectivity. So 
this extreme power domination this extreme power domination orientation is of course a fundamental misunderstanding in terms of where your experience is actually coming from so anything that can help the person to kind of discover that wait a minute um, my experience is actually generated within me it's thought taking form moment by moment as an expression of consciousness the the more someone can be guided to to see that the less this power domination orientation would even make sense because you suddenly realize that hey that's not really where my experience is coming from now whether someone who's really psychopathic would would even have the capacities to begin to be interested in learning something like that i don't know one thing i do know though from reading is that there is one way of working which has documented effects on youth who have scored high on psychopathic traits and this is something called the Mendota Juvenile Treatment Center in Wisconsin in the United States. And after this particular uh, training program, it, it's a prison for, for young people. Um, people who get sent back to prison who are psychopathic uh, after that, who have not done that particular program, have a 98% rate of going back the the people who uh, have completed this program have a 64 percent chance of going back so it's like a 34 percent reduction and what they do at mendota which is very interesting is that it's not at all based upon punishment so if someone's psychopathic you know that that they don't fear feel that much anxiety or fear they don't feel any guilt there's not really a conscience there so, so trying to use punishment then to change someone proves futile. So it's, it's, it's based upon immediate rewards for good behavior and pro-social behavior. So if you behave well and you do the right things, you get immediate rewards. If you do really good things, you get really good immediate rewards. And in this way, people are steered into behaving and thinking differently and it seems to work quite well so i think if you're going to work with someone who seems to have some of these tendencies you have to play to their self-interest to, to to see that they are better off in satisfying their own perceived needs by thinking better thinking more clearly thinking through consequences doing good things for other even if it's even if they're still callous and it's not necessarily based in empathy or compassion per se now uh, if you want to read more about the mendota uh, thing you, you you can read uh, kent keel's book the psychopath whisperer which goes into this in some detail it's a really interesting book um on the topic though of empathy um empathy is not the end all be all so a, a lot of people seem to tend to believe that that if only people were more empathetic that would change the world but empathy is a very selective response and emotion uh, per se so if you look at, for example, violent offenders, how empathetic someone is per se doesn't tell you much about who's going to reoffend or not. Actually, their, their past history of reoffending is, is the best predictor of whether they will reoffend or not. So empathy seems very tribal. It's, it's very selective. So, so people tend to feel empathy with people they identify with people who are part of their tribe you know e even people who describe themselves as very empathetic if you take a person who who's very vogue 
and very left leaning and 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 you, you try to probe for how much empathy they may have for a hardcore Donald Trump supporter or vice versa a hardcore Donald Trump supporter and someone you know amongst the vote brigade not not much empathy empathy can, can often make us make less good decisions you know the the empathy that we feel for our in-group is often at the expense of the rest of humanity so so for example in the um, back in 2015 w w when you had the invasion of uh, young men from muslim majority countries i'm saying invasion because most of these people were not refugees of war Maybe 20, 25% were, but most of them were not. And what made, what really made Norwegians want to open their borders was an empathy response. The, the, the tide really turned when they saw these images of this young boy drowned on some beach in Greece. And, and people empathized, they felt enormous pain and they wanted to alleviate that pain by opening their borders. Now, is this a wise, rational decision? Not really, because, because the consequence of this is that you get thousands of more dead kids who, who, who drown at sea, you know, and, and, and you, you get an influx of, of people with religious attitudes, uh, Islamic extremist attitudes, that are not at all compatible with the ideals of freedom in the West. So what you're kind of ensuring is that your kids and grandkids are going to have to fight very hard to have even a little bit of the same freedoms that you yourself were brought up with. So it's empathetic in a sense, but in all likelihood, not a very not a very good decision. So rational compassion seems to be a better, a better move, a better orientation, you know, wanting someone to be free of suffering. Uh, there was an experiment with Matthew Ricard and Tanya Singer back in 2007, of course, compassion is the happiest state recorded in the neuroscience lab. Uh, where it was shown that, that empathy and compassion activates quite different neural circuitry in the brain. So you can, you can base your ethics on compassion, a rational form of compassion, even if you don't have that much empathy. And I think, as I mentioned previously, the in my latest episode, the, the scientist who it was a diagnosed psychopath who claimed that meditation and meditative experiences had transformed her world, uh, discovering the nature of, of consciousness and that she fundamentally shares the same being with everyone and everything, that's the realization that there is no other per se. That orientation of really having a recognition that you share your, 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 your fundamental being with everyone and everything makes it less likely that you're going to do intentionally cruel things to people. But you may not still be the most empathetic uh, person in the world, even if you do have that realization. So, I think that was what I wanted to say on this particular topic uh, for now. In my next episode, I'm going to be talking about the, the difference between the wisdom of psychopaths and spiritual insights. That There's a guy called Kevin Dutton who wrote a book called The Wisdom of Psychopaths, where, where he kind of, I think conflates the two a little bit so i want to i want to make a an episode on that specifically 
Uh, as always, if, if you have any questions, feel free to, to leave them, any comments where you find the video. Uh, if you're curious to work with me as a client, you can reach out to me at provocativehypnosis.com. And um, if you're watching this in March 2023, know that I'm doing a seminar on the psychological illusion model. Uh, March 25th and 26th, 2023 is going to be online. So if you're curious about that, you can go to provocativehypnosis.com and check out the seminar page. Till next time, thanks for listening.